grief shows up with us when it comes to people and then grief also shows up when it comes to our plans most people in the bible who had the deepest relationship with god also had the deepest questions of god what does it look like to grieve something that i don't even necessarily want back but sometimes lord i actually do i don't want grief to rob me of moments that are supposed to produce joy yeah. find value in god's presence even when we don't necessarily get understanding we can get his hand and we can get his heart unfortunately what we will do is we will allow our emotions and our circumstances and what we are feeling um, make us change how we see God what's going on family welcome to the beyond Sunday podcast the conversation you need with Sunday is just not enough the conversation you need with Sunday is just not enough the conversation you need Sunday is just not enough and I'm joined by the people C Ooh. and O. Let's go. I think that was one for the Father, <laughs> one for the Son, yeah. one for the Holy Spirit. Is he Keep you on your in toes. Yeah. Keep you on your toes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's that. like preparation for baptism Sunday, so he just had to do it. <laughs> he just... Yeah. No, I was like, I was trying to do mumble rap, you know, the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just keep saying the same thing over again real fast. Oh. That's how the mumble rappers do it. Oh, okay. Yep. Is uh, Busta Rhymes considered a, uh, like, mumble rapper? Or no. Ooh. I don't know if I no, know what. not a mumble rapper. He, he may be the origin story of, of mumble raps, rap. No, he raps fast, yeah. but it's not mumble rap. Does anybody know a Busta Rhyme? Yeah. Uh, Every verse? time I gotta get in. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I gotta look excited. Right, let's see. go! <laughs> <laughs> That's how my first album started off. Let's go! It is how oh, it started. Wow. When are you gonna put your album back on iTunes? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Never. <laughs> oh, I think you should. It's a great album. Independence Day was one of my Woo, favorites. Yeah. Boy, I, what a time to be alive. You about to do that bus time, but you had like the, the voice. I'll be doing that all the time. Oh, no, no. Do it all the Every time I got to get in. <laughs> <laughs> That's, really That's the only part I can remember. I can't remember the rest. Of, if it was playing, I used to like really try to. Yeah. So one of my things I used to do when I came home from school, well, like, look up the rap lyrics on YouTube to Ooh. try and, like, follow along. My grandma didn't like me watching 106 in Park, so I had to try and, <laughs> <laughs> I had to try and get my music somehow. So I used to go on YouTube and try and, like, rap along with the people, but... Were you there for 106 She didn't Park? get the same 106 in Park I was experience just that say, we had. Did you get AJ and Free? No, she did not. No, I did. There's oh, no yeah. way you got AJ and Free. Who you get? AJ... AJ was a black dude with... Okay, what a minute, Sierra. All of them were well, black. They That's were all Sierra. black. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think of... Okay, you, that got wasn't Terrence, a good... you got Terrence and another little light-skinned girl. Okay, yes. And then Bow Wow yes, and yes, another yes, light-skinned girl. Yes, okay, Bow Wow yes. ended up being a host? Yes, Bow Wow, yes. yes. Oh, That's, I, had... I remember Terrence and Bow Wow. That must have been on the downcast. That I was, was about down... to say, was, I remember... It was when the show was about Bow to be Bow Wow was more... Ter I remember Terrence and Bow Wow was more prominent when I remember. Wow. Yeah. But I do remember Terrence. So maybe it wasn't AJ. It wasn't AJ and Free for sure. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Did you know that that wasn't AJ's actual hair? Hmm. I just found that out like earlier this year on TikTok. It was like what, a wig or something? Yeah, they were installing that every day. Get yourself out of here. Yep. Look it up. <laughs> Look it up. Wow. <laughs> Man. You and AJ's Little hair is about wow. the same length. Hey, like did. what he. <laughs> What they were installing, <laughs> wow! What they wow, were installing we're into his hair is like the length of your hair now. The man? Yeah, that's why I said you don't no, know. It was AJ. long though. It was yeah. long. So he had. Well, like, why did they do that if it wasn't his? No, this is what the type of haircut he had. It was braids in the front and then locks and then a fade on both sides with lines. I in gotta it. look this up as soon as yeah. we get off set. That's why when know. I said when he asked, "Do you know AJ and Free?" You could not forget. Okay. Yeah. yeah no. You when you said the other names, that's why I was like, I definitely remember Bow Wow, but I knew there was another host. And I was never saw One Hundred Six in part with Bow Wow hosting a day in my life. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, we were in college. By I didn't get that a little Bow Wow. You, you just, just don't, don't know the way you move so fast across the. The flow. I mean, mm -hmm. you run it through my mind like all the time to the point that I just want to take you home. So I love Bow Wow because Sierra and Bow Wow used to date. So what? I used to be like, oh, Bow Wow's my boyfriend because my name too is Sierra. Oh, wow. And you um, also were a singer. Delivered from that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Anyway, y'all remember the hook to their song with Sierra and Bob? I ain't never had nobody show me all the things that you can show me in a special way. I, I feel, feel when you show me, we will always be together, baby. That's, that's what, what you, you told, told me. me, and I believe it because I ain't never had nobody do me like you. <laughs> Sierra want to be an artist. So <laughs> and name all the, and name all the books of the Bible in order. Okay, Genesis. That's <laughs> <laughs> the problem with the saints now. No autumn lyrics. I mean, riddle them off. I went to a Christian school, so we had Bible tests Girl, where I, I had to take. 
I had to put the, the in seminary. We had to go through all sixty six. Yeah, I, man, it's really crazy that we really used to be getting quit. Like we would get quizzed on the Bible, and that was a real great. Like you would get a grade for a Bible I never class. Never had any of those schools or classes or anything. Uh-huh. Yeah, like after seminary. Yeah, in seminary, yes. In public school, no. Well, I went to a Christian school mm. in elementary up Whew. till middle. That's so good. Yeah, it really shaped me into a great, you know, <laughs> woman of God here. <laughs> My God, today, wow, well. <laughs> Here we are, totally off topic from what we're talking about today. Um, we're actually going to be talking about grief and loss. Um, so to start off the conversation, I want to ask a question. Um, what is something that you have lost that you wish you could get back? My waistline. <laughs> <laughs> Was it there at one point? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> there was a time in my life where, you know, I had abs and I was in shape and oh, playing wow. basketball mm. three or four times a day and. You know, mm. just many double quarter pounders and large fr- pasta vernon. Oh. oh, pasta vernon. I've seen you. I've known you for a long time. I don't know about abs. I mean, smaller. I did see yes. a, old, a picture of you where you. I said, "Oh, Omar used to yeah. really be skinny." Yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't old know about abs. You've never seen me with my shirt off. Touche. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad we clarified that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I mean, I, if y'all went to the pool together, to or something. Who? I put it in the show notes. All right, but we're not uh, putting that in the show notes. Not. No, because people be trying to play me yeah, when I do. tell them that I used to have abs. Because a lot of people met me when I was big, and they don't know the form. Big focus. <laughs> big focus. <laughs> <years. laughs> they don't know my informative years. I was really out here. It's getting on the west side of the kingdom. On the west side of the kingdom. Man. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, lost, which good. My dog Shadow. Aww. Yeah, I was. I was. What year was I? I think I was in middle school. No, I was in elementary school elementary school and um we went to bible study one night mm-hmm. came home and shadow was at the fence and he wasn't moving mm-hmm. and i went over to shadow and i said shadow shadow <laughs> <laughs> this is not supposed to be fun <laughs> shadow. <laughs> shadow get up and oh, man. Oh, shadow I feel was, like this is a movie shadow was gone from here and uh but you know i found out my neighbor came my mother kid and fed him something through the fence. Oh. And um oh. and Shadow ate it and um oh. man, I miss Shadow. Shadow. Did y'all sue her? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Omar. <laughs> I just feel like she she What's unalived happening? your dog. Like, <laughs> y'all should be entitled to compensation. Unalived your dog is another crazy <laughs> statement. Just said she killed your dog. No, wow. she killed your dog sounds very aggressive. Unalived is mm. very original. Man, how about you, Sierra? <laughs> man, um, Well, I've lost a lot of things in life because I tend to lay things down and just (laughs) forget where I put it at. But um, there was one time specifically. Now, this may seem very you guys have shared some really um, sentimental things, but uh, I lost a blanket one time. Um, And if you know me, you know, I, I love blankets and. I may have trauma bonded with this blanket. You know when you go through some things and you just got that blanket that's been a comforter just to hold your tears and all the things as you, yeah. Only know the Holy Spirit is comfortable. Okay, (laughs) wow, okay. Well, I'm not saying Holy Spirit and uh, uh, this blanket in particular. And I remember I went to um, out of town or whatever and we were staying at a hotel and I left the blanket at the hotel and I literally called them and I was like, I will come back to get this blanket. Um, and they were like, we threw it away. Um, oh, man. And I said, wow, that's really insane of y'all to throw away a blanket. They could, should have assumed that the person was going to come back to get it. For a blanket? <laughs> this blanket sounds like it was an idol. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not an idol, but it was just one that I really love. I mean, you know, I, I ended up having to let go of it, and I got another blanket, and I've gotten more since. But at that time, I loved that blanket, and it had been with me. Yes. Don't just bear about what, how old were you? Oh, I don't know. We need to, to discuss this. <laughs> I don't know. If we... I feel like this is the very part important. when she said, um, "I will come back and get it." Told you gave me a deeper revelation. Go. I was a freshman in college. So oh man! I think what what part of it was this was a blanket from home. Okay. And I was in okay. college, so I got part you. of it was like, "Hey, this is a piece of like home that I've had for a really long time," and I left this blanket, and I would like okay. to come that, back. That's good. That's helpful. Thank you. It's helpful context. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm One time I left my Bible at a hotel. And did you I, drop back to get it? Did you go back to get I, it? Oh, yeah. I turned up. I said, hey, I left my Bible. It's a blue book. It's real big. I left it on the desk. And they that time they actually had it and was like, yeah. So now what I did do was I actually paid to have it shipped to me. It was in D.C. Um, mm. And I left it. Um, and so they, they shipped it right on back. And I had to pay money for it. And I, I did not mind. I cried. 
I cried. I was so scared because I had trauma from my blanket. I was like, oh, God, they <laughs> threw my Bible. How <laughs> dare they throw the holy word of God away? But they didn't. Praise the Lord. Woo. Yeah. I feel like one has a little bit more reverence than the other. Oh, absolutely. For yeah. sure. But both were tough moments. I had PTSD. <laughs> so I was so scared. Um, but, you know, that that is certainly on a, a lighter note. Um, but grief is something that we uh, have all at some point in time, whether um, it was a dog, whether Yum. it was our waistline, a blanket um, or a person. Um, <laughs> have experienced grief uh, and this is something that can be hard um, as Christians as we are navigating the emotions that come with grief as well as uh, how we see God um, mm-hmm. on the other side of grief and so just wanted to dive into this conversation today about what it looks like um, to handle grief how has grief shown up in you all's lives uh, as well as how has grief um, maybe changed or shifted um, or just altered the way you viewed Christ or maybe your relationship with him as well um, as you were going through that grief or loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's such a good question. I actually think that grief shows up in two areas of our life specifically. Grief shows up with us when it comes to people, and then grief also shows up when it comes to our plans. Mm. So sometimes we grieve when when people pass away, and we have to go through the five stages of grief mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to processing that. But then sometimes <laughs> grief shows up in our plans because we have these ideas and these timelines that we have to grieve. Yeah. So for prime example, you know, when I was five years old, I thought that at this age, Age, I would be at this level of life, this status, um, I would have this family, I would be married, I would be a homeowner, I would be all these things. And then you get to that age, or for some people, you can see it as you near that age, like, hey, where I thought I was going to be and the level of resources I thought I was going to have, I don't have it yet. And yeah. then I have to process I've been married to this idea for so long that now I have to start to say, okay, what does my life now look like now that I recognize this fantasy is never going to be a reality? Uh, Sometimes grief has such a finality uh, to it if you allow your feelings to dictate to you how you're supposed to perceive what is actually happening. Mm. So when you ask the question, how does it impact your relationship with Christ? I think grief has taught me uh, that God is sovereign even when I'm sad. Mm. Mm -hmm. I I think a lot of times I only celebrate his sovereignty when he opens a door or when God answers a prayer. I had to learn that God is still sovereign even when he does opposite of what I pray for. God is still sovereign and God is still good even when I am grieving that he allowed something or permitted something that I know that he could have stopped. Um, And I'll tell you a specific way that this showed up when it came to me grieving losing my father. So I remember being very angry with God the day that I had to pull the plug um, on my dad. And um, I remember screaming Mm. in the car saying, God, why are you doing this to my dad? Mm. And the Holy Spirit, as clear as they say, you think that I'm punishing your father. This is actually his escape. Mm. And I had to process that statement. And then a year later, I had a, a similar moment It was the one year anniversary of my father passing and I was just so angry. And, you know, I said once again, I said, God, I can't believe you allowed this to happen. Um, And then the Lord said something to me that really settled my heart and reminded me that he was sovereign, even though I didn't like what he allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. And God said, Omar, before he was ever your father, he was already my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that took a level of maturity Mm -hmm. for me to accept what God was saying. Because essentially what he was saying to me was, I am not going to say sorry for what is bringing you sorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that it takes maturity to be able to process that. Because in, in grief, I had to recognize that God may allow something that I don't understand, but it caused me to go deeper into my devotion time with God because I had to learn how to process death uh, differently. Mm. And what I mean by that is, have you ever heard somebody say, you know, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? When somebody loses a parent Mm -hmm. or they lose a family Mm -hmm. member, it's like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? And God kind of challenged me specifically concerning my theology surrounding death Mm. to where people always look at death as something that happened to someone instead of death being something that happened for someone. 
Now, I'm only talking about people who died in Christ. And what I mean by that, I started to look at death as a portal that transfers people from uh, the corruptible to the incorruptible, mm. to the destructible to the indestructible. And the Apostle Paul is very clear um, in his writings about how we are going to take off this corruptible flesh and put on the incorruptible. And then I started to tie that into the, the scriptures that say we don't mourn as those who have no hope. Yeah. So this impacted my relationship with Christ because I started to recognize, wait a minute, my mourning and my grieving should look different from yeah. those who are, are non-believers. Yeah. Uh, because if I believe God's word to be true, this is the moment to where in pressurized situations, it's only what's in you that's going to come out of you. Yeah. If I give you an orange and you squeeze the orange, orange juice is going to come out. Right. So essentially when pressure is applied, what's in you comes out. I think that grief actually reveals the depth of your devotion. Mm. Because if only your feelings come up and no word comes out of you, I got to examine myself and say, wait a minute, do I believe what I've been proclaiming on all of the sunny days? Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, that's just how grief has kind of impacted my relationship with Christ. Because through my grieving, through my sadness, I said, wait a minute, why isn't the word showing up in this area even through my grief? Yeah. Yeah. I um, First and foremost, I think I, I want to pause and just thank you for your vulnerability. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for, for both C and I, we, we haven't lost a parent. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, for you to be able to share, you know, certainly we, we honor that and thank you for, for being willing to share with all of us so that we can be able to grow from your story. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's somebody watching right now who resonates like, Hey, Omar gets me in a way that Vernon doesn't, that Sierra yeah. doesn't. And, um, and so just just gratitude and I, I even would want to ask a couple follow-up questions but but but, but I'll, I'll save that I think for me I'll just say I my journey is probably a slightly different path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um I, I think um one of the things I think we miss about grief is grief is a journey not a destination yeah mm -hmm. um it's not a place that you get to yeah and then say I'm done Right. Um, I think it is often a journey you take and you take it with God yeah. mm -hmm. and you take it with people and and who are supportive and, and, and there for you. And you take it with your own questions and mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings and emotions. Um, and I think what God gives us is hope that we don't have to sit where we are in our grief, yeah. mm -hmm. but that if we keep moving forward, there is a hope and there is a joy and there is a peace that we can find on the way. Um, I think for me, I mean, I think you perfectly articulated when you talk about people and plans. I, I think um, certainly you've experienced it on both hand, both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'll specifically talk about two sides of this. One, I think as a former cancer patient and uh, growing up in hospitals, I think one of the things that really encouraged me was this revelation that most people in the Bible who had the deepest relationship with God also had the deepest questions mm. Mm -hmm. and God wasn't afraid yeah. of their questions. Yeah. And so I think a part of grief is understanding that God can handle, he is big enough yeah. Yeah. to handle your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he could handle Job's questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. He could handle David's questions. Yeah. He could handle Moses's questions. Yep. He could like like all these people are like, wait a minute, God, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you doing? Yeah. yeah. And God doesn't run from them. Yeah. He still runs towards them. Yeah. yeah. And so I think so much of my journey was not the lack of grief. Like I I, I grieved in in moments and I grieved in cycles. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think that's an important distinction. Yeah. For me. There were moments that I grieve when I just like will find out, man, life is never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, I also grieve in cycles, right? Like there are times when I still am like, man, I wonder what I think you uh, one I had recently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fine. I'm, I'm loving my kids, blah, blah, blah. And then I had a thought one day, like, what if my son is not, and this is all the enemy playing tricks in my head, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what if my son is not, uh, a athlete or a basketball player or whatever, 
because he never could see his dad be that. Mm. Yeah. Right? You know, I'm like, dang. What if he would have saw me? Like, I saw my dad play basketball. I saw right. my dad run. I saw my dad. My son can't see me do that. Mm. So it's cyclical. I'm like, yeah. so now I'm like, three days, I'm down. <laughs> I'm down bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, man, if I was just yeah. a more active dad, if I had mm. two good legs, if I had. Mm -hmm. And so I do think, like, for the person who's watching this, too, who's like, oh, my God, I feel like this keeps coming back. Yeah. Like, also be aware that some things are cyclical. Family is, you know, you don't lose a person. And then never think about them again, yeah. right. you yeah. know. Um, and so, and I love to ask you about that. But I would just encourage somebody like that's a part of this journey, and just uh, give yourself grace, yeah, mm -hmm. right. But but what I, what you said is, but you can always come back to God, yeah. yeah. And He wants to take that journey with you. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to take it alone. Yeah, no, you know. I mean, echoing what He said, definitely. Um, thank you for your transparency and vulnerability, and um, even in the conversation, I think for me, thinking about grief, of course that first kind of initial thought was thinking about like people that we've lost or mm -hmm. um, those type of deaths that we've experienced. And um, like knowing I'm like, man, like Omar has lost somebody who is extremely close to him and you've experienced grief in a different way than I have where, you know, the closest people in my family that have passed away have been um, my uncle and my aunt. And I remember mm -hmm. um, processing that grief differently um, because it was like, I was more so hurt because of like, it was my grandparents sibling and like seeing them hurt was like, oh man, like I'm, I'm hurting for them. And now I'm trying to go to the Lord to how do I be a light for my family? How do I um, show up for them? And while I still, you know, have my own grief of like, man, like I, I've never experienced this before. This is mm -hmm. new to me. Um, processing that and just grateful that was a time where I did spend you know a significant amount of time in the book of Job just to see mm -hmm. how did God show up in a, a moment of loss and things like that and trying to do that but I think for me <clears throat> a way that grief has shown up uh more for me um and I've shared this but I think grieving my old way of life um mm -hmm. and that tension when you step into you know the newness of Christ and um, who he's called you to be that uh, there is a grief that does take place when you are beginning to think about the things that um, like we're dying to our old selves yeah and with yeah. death comes grief and I think sometimes we feel as though you know grief should not show up in the things that we you know killed off to live a mm. new life in Christ because it's like oh well those things were not like Christ those were things that you know I had to shed and get rid of in order to step in the fullness of who he called me to but what happened when the death looks like killing off people that we are close with or yeah. you know killing off spaces and places and things that we were mm -hmm. um, so comfortable and conditioned to being in and sometimes I ended up grieving things that I didn't necessarily want back mm. but because it was just so unfamiliar for me to not have it um, mm -hmm. grief was a natural emotion to feel yeah. like I, I want this thing back yeah. um, when it really it wasn't you know reality um, and so I talk about that a lot of that was one of those things that I struggled with because I also really didn't see people talking about it. It was like when you came to Christ, it was just, oh, we're running towards the yeah. mark. We're running mm -hmm. after Jesus and we've laid the old things behind and it sounds so good. But what happens like the Israelites when you get to the wilderness and you mm -hmm. like, amen, take me back to Egypt. <laughs> like yeah. It ain't nothing out yeah. here for yeah. me. Um, and I had to, you know, work through that process of God. What does it look like? to grieve something that I don't even necessarily want back, but sometimes, Lord, I actually do. Mm. Um, and mm. I, I know I'm not supposed to have it. Um, and I remember just struggling with that. And God just gave me a revelation of like, I can handle your grief. Mm. I can handle um, what you're going through. And we so often talk about those five stages of grief. And I feel like it showed up even in that context. But what I thought was like those five stages were like a ladder of like you kind of hit stage one and then you go up to stage two and then you go up to stage three. Mm -hmm. And then I started to get discouraged because I felt like I was on stage three, stage four. And then one morning I woke up and I felt like I was back at stage one. Wow. And it was like, what? well, how did I get back here? I thought I was so much further than this in my grieving process. Mm -hmm. And I had to realize like grieving was not linear. It was not a ladder that I was climbing up but that it was a constant cycle of there are going to be days where you feel like you've gotten over your anger you've gotten over the frustration mm -hmm. and you've come to acceptance and then there may be a day where it's like man I don't understand this like, I, it's hard mm -hmm. for me to accept yeah. it um, and I had to process the fact that just because it felt like I was going backwards did not actually mean that I had not had any growth um, or that I hadn't gotten f as far as I thought I had in the growth um, in my grieving process but that it wasn't a linear process or like a mm -hmm 
ladder, but it was a process and it was circular. And it was like, hey, it may feel like you're going in a cycle of grief, but really like there is things that God is doing in your heart and things are shifting and things are changing and you are healing and some things aren't hurting you as much as they used to. Uh, But grieving the past life was something that I really had to uh, I had to work through um, and really overcome and then trust that it was okay. Um, to give God that emotion. I think that is really profound because everybody doesn't lose people, but we all are called as Christians Mm. to lose an old life. Yes. And I mean, I think that's a universal grief that we probably don't talk about enough. I would probably make it feel like, man, gave my life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I I don't don't think about those people, those things, that place and like, nah, actually, yeah. Some days I look on my timeline and I'm like, oh, everybody having a good time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Man. I'm just sitting here. Yeah. So that is super helpful. And I love what you say. Like, I think this idea of like going back to this idea of like cycles, I, I do think like you got to be very discerning about what should be a moment mm-hmm. and what's human yes. to be a cycle. Yeah. I think one of the things we make the mistake about even in Christian um, in Christendom is we make people feel like what Christian means is you're superhuman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When all God has ever asked us to be is just human. Yeah. yeah. And being human yeah. means that um, there are some things that I need to just be like, no, 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 no. I grieved that for a moment. Yes. Yeah. There are some things that it is human yeah. to grieve for a lifetime. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, I'd love to ask you this question if I can just, you know, I'm to the level of your comfort sharing, mm-hmm. but like as someone who's lost um, a parent, mm-hmm. what, what is it like for you, like the humanity of, mm-hmm. like you're like I, I think I've heard you tell a story before about like wanting to call your dad or something like that. Like what is, what what? I, and again, I'm I'm trying to find the words because mm-hmm. it's not my experience. Yeah. But like I would imagine mm-hmm. that that level of that type of grief is not something that you just it it gets erased, but that you constantly experience in new ways. Can you just speak a little bit to that, to somebody who might be going through that? Yeah, um, f- for me, um, grief actually made me fearful of celebratory moments. Mm. And mm. I'll unpack what I mean by that. Like, you know, I had just started seminary when my father transitioned. Mm. So like, I started to pre-grieve mm. my graduation day because it was like, man, my dad's not gonna be here. Yeah. Mm. When I think about getting married, there's this pre-grief of, man, it's going to be a celebratory day, but I already know there's going to be a part of me on that day that says, dad was supposed to be here yeah. mm. for that. For context, for those who are watching, uh, my father was 20 when I was born. So I never saw a world that I wouldn't grow old yeah. with my dad. You know, whenever I have children one day, I, I'm, you know, I, I look at pictures of my father holding me and my sister who are 10 months apart. And I have several several siblings, but me and my sister who grew up in the same household were 10 months apart. And there are pictures, Polaroid pictures, of my sister on one side of my dad's chest and me on the other side of my dad's chest. And I grieve knowing that I'm gonna wanna make that phone call and say, you know, dad, how did you handle mom when she was going through postpartum? Or how did you, and I'm not gonna be able to make mm-hmm. that phone call to him. So I think for me, um, the humanity was, it, it, it forced me as a man to confront my emotions. Mm-hmm. Cause I don't like showing my vulnerable side. I dis, mm-hmm. I have, I've mastered doing it because yeah. of my profession, Got but you. I don't naturally like showing um, my vulnerable side. So I think for me, it forced me to deal and confront my humanity in a way that I was not prepared to. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say that scripture is true, that God is a very present help Mm. in the time of trouble. Yeah. So every time grief has tried to consume mm. a celebratory moment, I have had to pray and say, no, God, I'm, I don't want grief to rob me of moments that are supposed to produce joy. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I worked yeah. hard yes. to graduate yes. and I'm not gonna allow the enemy to utilize grief, which is a real thing, but yeah. it's like, no, now grief is being weaponized against yeah. me. Yep. So I wanna be very yep. clear. It's very human to grieve. Yeah. And there is a time and a season, and we'll talk about this later, for us to grieve. Yeah. But I won't allow the enemy to weaponize yeah. my grief yeah. to rob me of moments that are supposed to bring me That's joy. Good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, I, I'll just add really quickly, and, and I know we've been on this question for a little bit, but I think there's like another form of grief that, um, and man, before I move on to that, like just 
the soberness of what you just shared yeah. is just, I, I am imagining, and, and I don't know if this is the Holy Spirit or not, um, or some might, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, man, like to somebody who's just heard what always said, and maybe you feel like you're there. Mm-hmm. Like maybe you feel like, hey, I am I am legitimately grieving, pre-grieving yeah. mm-hmm. moments, um, but you just talked about like the Holy Spirit is a present help Mm. in a time of need it's, we've never done this before but can you just pray like in this moment mm. yeah. for the person really quickly who just I think might be experiencing that maybe mm. even at present yeah. mm. and don't need to wait 40 minutes to get a prayer yeah. like, you know, can you just pray <laughs> yeah. for them right now yep. yeah. yeah absolutely um, God I'm thankful that you fully know your children yeah. you know all that we are feeling and all that we are internalizing even if we never articulate it or express it out loud. But I'm thankful, God, that I have come to know through experience that you are a comforter, mm. that you are a helper. Uh, I am thankful that I have learned in real time that you bind up our wounds, you soothe our wounds, even the wounds of the heart, yeah. the wounds that are caused by disappointment. Yeah loss and grief rather those who are listening right now are grieving people family parents Mm. that they've lost or rather people are grieving their ideas and grieving their their plans that say god i i thought that life was going to look one way and it looks completely different than i could have ever imagined God, I'm so thankful that you are God who stands outside of time and that you are not bound by time. And I'm thankful, God, that you can step in and close the gap and you can help us to move beyond our feelings. God, I pray for everybody who's listening that you would help them to know that even though you have given us our feelings, that our feelings are not final and that you get the final say. Mm. So now, God, our prayer is that peace would actually be a conqueror in our lives. That peace would make grief to submit. That God, that in moments where we feel so deeply because of plans that did not materialize the way that we thought that it was going to, that you would give us joy, that you would give us a festive praise, that we would not live our life and grief would not cause us to live in despair, but that God, we would learn to trust you even when we don't understand what you have allowed. So God, I'm I'm thankful for everybody who is watching and I even testify through this prayer that God, through the suicidal ideations, the moments I wanted to give in the towel, the moments that I wanted to give up, I pray for that individual where grief has somebody on the brink of making that decision. God, I pray that they would overcome by the power of this testimony that says that God will make you fall in love with life again, Mm. even when life has knocked the wind out of you even when grief has knocked the wind out of you. So Father, I just pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would incite within them a passion to want to live again. So for everybody who was watching, I just declare over your life, live until you see the goodness of the Lord fully manifest in your life. God, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Man. Episode uh <laughs> yeah. episode got a chokehold on me. Wait a minute now. Yeah. Um, oh my god. I, I will I will um turn a corner there. Um and um and I'm I'm just I just believe that somebody really needed that prayer. Yeah. yeah. Um so reach out to us. Like I think that's mm-hmm. just a yeah. let us know um mm-hmm. how we can be praying for you and supporting mm-hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. Um I, I'll throw one thing out there really quick. I know we've been on this point one for a minute, but um, the, the thing I'll just add really quick that I don't know if people talk about, I think you brought up a unique form of, or really not a unique form of grief, but probably a less talked about yeah. form of grief. Mm-hmm. But um, people talk a lot about church hurt. I don't think they talk about church grief for leaders. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'll just kind of stand on the soapbox for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think we know that people get hurt by the church. I don't think we talk about leaders who are hurt yeah. um, by the church that they lead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, you know, I think there is a grief that comes when people, uh, are no longer with you, Mm -hmm. um, because there's a plan in people that you love too. Yeah. And, uh, one of the best advices that I received from, um, Bishop Younger, um, was 
Uh, I said, you know, I asked him one day what kind of advice would he give. Mm -hmm. And um, amongst many things that was extremely wise and extremely helpful, he said, um, you're preaching to a parade mm -hmm. that people will come into frame and they mm -hmm. will go out of frame and, mm -hmm. um, and that we have to lead with open hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's hard. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I, I think people assume that because you keep getting up to preach, yeah. you keep getting up to lead, you keep casting vision, mm -hmm. you keep appointing people leaders that yeah. you're not grieving yeah. what leader is not there yeah. mm -hmm. or what people transition. Like, yeah. oh, you feel that and you miss them. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are people who I still look to the right or to the left and I'm like, man, I remember so-and-so sitting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, that's just another, like, I think a grief that we don't yeah. often think about that is very real um, and that shows up in all of our leadership. So anyway, those, that, we keep moving, but I just yeah. thought about that. Yeah, I, I would love to to raise this question because I'm sure this is a question that many people have even asked themselves. They've yeah. either asked a, a friend, um, but there is this, this thought, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Mm -hmm. And how how should someone even reconcile this thought within themselves? Yeah. Yeah. Such a good question. Um, I think there is the, the word it, theology, the theological term for this is theodicy. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of why do bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. um, and let me start by saying, I don't think there is a satisfactory answer yeah. mm -hmm. that covers every situation. Right. Right. Um, I think the danger um, with, with moments that we feel that question emerge mm -hmm. is that we are looking for either a justification or a rationalization for it. And I think actually the mistake that, that even those of us as ministry leaders can make is to try to oversimplify pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there's not, there's not good answers yeah. to why a child dies in a parent's arms. Right. Um, there's not good answers to why, um, I mean, and we see this all the time in our church, like to why, you know, a person who has been faithful mm -hmm. and, 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 and committed to the God that can do all things, doesn't give them the ability to have a child mm -hmm. or they finally can have a child and they lose that child in birth. There, there's mm -hmm. not good answers for yeah. why a family member dies in a car accident suddenly, like there are things that happen yeah. mm -hmm. that we don't have good answers for. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important that we acknowledge that these moments are invitations from God. Yeah. And here's the key, not always to understand, but to always know that he's still with us. Yes. Yeah. I think we actually do people a disservice when we try to convince them that they'll always understand. Yeah. Right. I think a better invitation is um, he's the God, Emmanuel, his character is to be with you. Yeah. yeah. And he tells us in Psalm 23 that he's with us, not just on the mountain seasons, yeah. but in the valley as well. Yeah. yeah. And so I think first thing I would want to encourage is I think what we have to do is um, find value in God's presence even when we don't necessarily get understanding, we can get his hand and we can get his heart. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that as we navigate these moments, I think often God's sovereignty is the word that kind of really shows up. Mm -hmm. And um, and this takes maturity in your faith. Yeah. Yes. yes. Right? Like, I want to name that, right? And I think sometimes, again, we just, we put an unfair pressure on people. Be like, well, you should just trust God. Like, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm new to new this to thing. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm well, I don't even know what that word means, right. bro. Yeah. Like, yeah. So God's sovereignty at, at its core, simplest definition, my definition is his authority and rule over all things. Yeah. yeah. That God can do anything. Yes. Mm. Um, that he's in control. Yes. Yeah. Um, which means that when he does and when he doesn't. Do, Correct. Yes. Yes. I have to learn how to trust that his character hasn't changed. Yes. When my circumstances did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is why scripture tells us to lean out onto our own understanding. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. in all that ways to trust in him. and, and follow yeah. him. And I think that's the the thing I would encourage is that is I'm not saying it's simple. Mm -hmm. saying it's easy it goes back to the original thought i'm saying i think he can handle mm -hmm. all the parts of you yeah mm -hmm. and walk with you and, and you can go to him and the last thing i'll say is found in romans 12 and um and i think it's in that 
that sovereignty and in that trust and in that confidence in him and him walking with us that we can then find what Romans 12 and two says is his perfect and pleasing will Mm -hmm. for our lives. Um, And I think sometimes his will um, doesn't align with our preferences. Correct. Um, But his character didn't change. Correct. Mm -hmm. Even though our circumstances did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think I always go back to the beginning of the fall, like when we see sin enter into the earth that Mm -hmm. um, technically like Sin, sin and living in this way was never God's intention. Yeah. Um, yeah. That he had a uh, design for the earth. He had a design for his people um, in mind when he created it. And unfortunately, um, sin then entered into the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Genesis 3, um, where we see the fall take place at the beginning, um, later in that chapter, uh, God then begins to speak about the consequences that will take place from now until forever, you know, Mm -hmm. um, until the coming of um, the new Adam and the new Christ that, hey, like these are the things that are gonna happen where we see that women are gonna have, um, you know, struggle in childbirth and Mm -hmm. that there's always gonna be, you know, these tension and things like that. And so um, we kind of see in that chapter at the very beginning of scripture that unfortunately evil has entered into into the world, but that was not, necessarily God's intent Mm -hmm. um but coming to terms with Mm -hmm. that unfortunately because evil does exist that means evil things will take place Mm -hmm. um and that it was not that you know I think sometimes we always wrestle well if God is sovereign if God is in control you know why would he allow these things and um it does you know, make us want to question, but there was always this, I know growing up in church, this big fear of like, you are not to question God or you are not to ask him questions. Um, And I think I had to learn that it wasn't that I am, um, you know, questioning the character of God or questioning, um, you know, who he is, but it was in my finite mind and what I can comprehend and what I can handle, like, God, I am confused Mm -hmm. and God, I am unsure and God, this did hurt me. Um, And I am curious as to, you know, why this happened or why I'm having to experience this Mm -hmm. pain. Um, And it was never asking a why from a place of I don't trust you Mm -hmm. or a why of I don't see you as Lord or I don't see you as sovereign. It is just a why because I don't understand. But I also know that you know me as human Mm -hmm. and you know me as (laughs) that I am flesh and that you are aware of that of me. And I think sometimes we don't go to God with our few full humanity. Mm-hmm. That is almost like we feel as though like God does not see us in that human form. And he's like, yeah. no, I know I made y'all from dust. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I know that you are flesh. I know that you're, you're not going to always be able to comprehend my, my nature and my goodness and my will and my way. Um, but it, he can handle those questions. Yep. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's time and time again in scripture um, where you see people ask him questions and, he always responds with with who he is and with his character and um i'm just like man like it's so crazy that i grew up in church feeling like man i can't ask god questions yet here throughout scripture i see time and time again (laughs) questions and god never ran from it or god never say how dare you you know ask me this or like why would you you know now there were times he was like listen i i I was the one who created your mouth so you're gonna go and you're gonna talk to pharaoh like hey i always go to gideon like he he had questions he asked for signs and god gave like he showed up in those ways and so um just that like understanding god's character um and how evil was in the world but also i i always go back to um the fact that Jesus came and dwelt as flesh as well. Um, And scripture talks about in Mark, actually Jesus is talking to a man who um, referenced him as good. And he talks about, you know, God is the only one um, Mm. who is good. And um, Jesus, the son of God came down as flesh who was actually good, who was actually pure, who was actually blameless, who actually never sinned. And he experienced one of the worst things that could have ever happened, Mm. that he got up on a a cross and died and took beatings and lashings and a death that he did not deserve to die. And it's like, man, like he was someone who was good, who did not deserve what happened to him. Um, And to to see that even in his goodness and even in him being this perfect person that he went through something that was not good. And like, I I don't know if that can be an encouragement to somebody to know that 
it is unfortunate the bad that we have to witness in this evil and corrupt world um but knowing that even god who is good allowed his son to get on a cross Mm -hmm. and experience something that was not good but it was really for our good (laughs) and Mm -hmm. it was really because he wanted to dwell with us and that he wanted to be with us um and that he would encounter um and have to go through something like that um just reflects on his again his goodness that he is good um and he had to experience something that wasn't yeah Hmm. I, I want to preference my response uh, coming alongside something you said. I don't know if what I'm getting ready to say is going to satisfy the listener, but I do hope that it sobers the mind mm. of the listener. Um, I have to raise this question. What metric are we utilizing to measure what is good and bad? Because mm. I think oftentimes we have to remember that God's understanding is incomprehensible. Mm. So there are times where we might experience something and we will prematurely declare, this is bad. God, why did you permit this? Mm. And we'll prematurely say that. And then when we get to the end of the experience, hindsight will teach us, oh, this felt bad in the beginning. Yeah. when God was working behind the scenes all along yeah. to cause this to work together for my good. Yeah. Um, David says in Psalms 119.71, he uses a very interesting statement. He says, it was good for me Mm. Mm -hmm. that I was afflicted. Now, typically, you would not utilize good and affliction Mm. to coexist together. But David makes this very interesting statement. He said, no, 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 it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn the statues, the characteristics, Mm. the attributes of God. Yeah. Without this affliction, I don't learn his character. Correct. Without this affliction, without this, and he doesn't specify what affliction he's referencing, mm-hmm. but I would summarize through his writings that he's, man, without some of these experience, I don't know God intimately yeah. the way that I would desire to. And this is one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. Um, it starts in Genesis. It's the story of of Joseph. And I'm, I'm going to take the scenic route just so I can land mm-hmm. at what his declaration is in Genesis 51. Uh, Joseph, for those of you who, who, who may not be aware, he had brothers who despised him. Mm-hmm. They hated him. They were jealous of him. And they essentially, they plot to kill him. And then they decide, hey, instead of killing him, let's sell him into slavery. Yeah. He gets sold into slavery by his brothers. Let's just park the car here. <laughs> Can you imagine your siblings whom you love yeah. to betray you? And there's yeah. nothing that you can do about it. Yeah, I got it. one brother. TJ, I wish you would. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And, and yep. having to sit with that hurt. <laughs> Joseph ends up um, in a man's house by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph lustfully, tries to press up on your boy. Mm-hmm. Joseph says, unhand me. <laughs> And she <laughs> lies on Joseph and was like, hey, like he tried to sexually assault me. And yeah. Potiphar has Joseph thrown in jail. Wait a minute. I've already been betrayed yeah. by my brothers. Now I've been lied on and nobody believes me. And he ends up in jail. He ends up in jail and he he comes across two people who work for the Pharaoh. And uh, he ends up interpreting their dreams. And, and long story short, one of the dreams that he interpreted exposes that he has a gift. Mm-hmm. One of the men get out of jail. They get back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh starts having a dream that he can't interpret. The man who did time goes, oh, wait a minute. There's a guy mm-hmm. who can interpret this dream for you. He interpreted my dream. They get Joseph out of jail. Joseph interprets the dream, and he ends up being in uh, Pharaoh's house, second in command in all of Egypt, and gets to bring his entire generation, his entire family, over to Egypt, and they enjoy prosperity until the day that Joseph dies. Here's the kicker. When he gets reunited with his brothers in this story, Joseph's father ends up passing away. They're like, Joseph, dad said, don't kill us when, you know, when he <laughs> dies. Yeah. And Joseph says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, yeah. you intended to harm me, yeah. but God intended it yeah. all for my good. Yep. Mm-hmm. So now let's backtrack this. He ends up being second in command over all of Egypt, and he establishes legacy yeah. for his entire lineage. But that doesn't happen if his brothers never sell him into slavery. Yeah. That doesn't happen if he doesn't get lied on by Pharaoh's wife. That doesn't happen if he spends time in jail. So again, this is why I have to raise the question. What metric are you utilizing when you say that why does God allow bad things yeah. to happen to good people? Because yeah. Joseph was a good man. He was a young boy who was tending to his father's yeah. sheep, telling his father, you know, reports of what was going out on yeah. the fields. 
something seemingly bad happened to a good person. But then when you get to the end of the story, yeah. it's like, wait a minute. God was behind the scenes causing the bad, the mm -hmm. pain, the betrayal. It was all working together yeah. for a uh, for an end result that was going to be good yeah. and complete and perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I always encourage people that when you're navigating through things to kind of take a step back and say, OK, God, with a sober mind, can you help me to endure this? Because I trust and believe that you have something good for me at the end of this that's going to work together for my good. Yeah, that's good. So good. So good. I mean, I think that leads us to this kind of last question that I think will help us just kind of frame, which is, I mean, if I'm grieving and mm -hmm. I've experienced loss and I want to be that, like, and this all sounds so ideal, guys. Yeah. Thank you for your scriptures yeah. and thank you for your <laughs> yeah. encouragement. But if I'm being honest, like, I'm kind of mad with God right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do I change that? Like, what? Yeah. What do I do when I'm actually upset with God? Yeah. What are some of the things you guys think about? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, that's the first person or thing that we kind of go to when mm -hmm. something in our life is not good um, or is not going the way that we intend. That often um, we, we automatically place the blame on God. Um, and I think that sometimes it's easier for us to kind of accept what's happening if we can just say, well, this is God's fault or God mm -hmm. did this. Um, and it can naturally feel like, well, I just if I'm going to be at angry, angry at somebody, I'm going to be angry at God because how could you, you know, allow this to happen? And unfortunately, what we will do is we will allow our emotions and our circumstances and what we are feeling um, make us change how we see God. Um, and now instead of seeing him as good as instead of seeing him as sovereign um, and all of the things loving and kind and gracious and merciful, instead of seeing him in all of those ways, we begin to see him through the lens of our emotions, mm. um, which causes us to think that he's evil and he mm. wants to harm me. He does not love me. He's not with me because I feel alone, because I feel like I've been hurted. I feel like I've been betrayed. And now our our emotions are becoming um kind of just the the foundation of how we in the lens of how we see God um but scripture is very clear that um like he is the same yesterday today and forevermore um that he cannot change um that his character um and who he is does not change based on our emotions based on what's happening around us what's happening to us um and sometimes that is hard to believe because God, how can you be good? Um, how can you be just? How can you be all of these things and allow this to happen? Um, but it is so important for us to not allow um, how we feel uh, to change how we see him mm -hmm. um, and trusting that, you know, no, this does not feel good. And no, I don't understand why this is happening. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm going to command my soul to bless the Lord because yeah. he yet still in in this he is still faithful um and he is still kind and he is still with me whether i feel like it or not um i have to tell myself the truth mm. i have to tell myself because those are the moments where the enemy loves nothing more than to creep in and tell us lies that mm -hmm. oh no like how could you know god wouldn't allow you to do this did he really say like mm. his tactics have been the same since the beginning and he wants us to believe that what he says was not actually true um and so i think that those are the moments where we really have to do our best of like taking up that assignment of commanding our soul our soul to actually telling ourselves no i'm going to tell my truth Tell, tell myself the truth even in those moments where I feel like um, my natural response would be anger. Mm -hmm. uh, my natural response would be frustration. Um, and even outside of grief, something that, you know, I've even wrestled with is sometimes we will put ourselves in certain situations and then get mad at God for us being in it. And it's like, man, like I actually never yeah. intended for you to be in this, but you never like you didn't listen to the signs. You didn't, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to these different flags and things like that. And it's just so easy for us to just blame God and be angry with God. Um, and I think sometimes we got to just take sit back and be like, hey, is this my emotions kind of controlling the way that I see him? Or am I speaking the truth? Am I am I going to scripture um, as hard as it is that really the, it comes down to like I've got to commit my soul um, to bless him in all times? Yeah, no, that is so good. I, I think I want to take this route uh, when it comes to that. You know, how do I deal with the fact that I'm I'm angry with God? There are five stages to grief. Um, there's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there is depression, there is acceptance. 
many people never get to five because they never can confront the fact that they're angry at number two. Mm. There's a book that's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Mm. Um, mm. I'm okay. Book. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's my book. <laughs> I'm gonna quote that book and I'm gonna quote Jay Z. Jay Z has Amen. a <laughs> Jay Z has a line where he says, "You can't heal what you never reveal." That's most people's issue. They can't even acknowledge the fact that they're angry with God. So they box God out of the anger. Yeah. And that's why they never heal from it. Yeah. I think that we have to recognize Genesis 126. Uh, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So I'm going to kind of be nerdy for a second. There are incommunicable attributes of God. And then there are communicable attributes of God. Mm -hmm. I'll explain what that is. Incommunicable attributes attributes of God are the characteristics or the attributes that God has all by himself mm. that he did not give that to humanity so God being at all places at all times that's an incommunicable attribute God always knowing the ending from the beginning that is an incommunicable attribute a communicable attribute of God is a characteristic of God that he shares with humanity mm emotions and feelings is a communicable mm -hmm. attribute. We were made in God's image and in his likeness. We know that God has emotions the same way that we do because the Bible says that God is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. We see in scripture that Jesus wept. Yeah. We see in scripture that there are moments where the Bible says, and God was sorrowful yes. that he ever created them, that he ever appointed yeah. them. So because God has emotions, we are like him because we have these emotions. Mm -hmm. We sometimes cut off the part of ourselves mm -hmm. that makes us just like him when we refuse to acknowledge God I'm angry yeah. God, yeah. I'm sorrowful really oh. God I am frustrated that yeah. you allowed this but I think what God actually desires is to say hey I'm God enough to handle your emotion but you do have to invite me into that correct the mistake that we make is that we get stuck in the five stages of grief we get stuck at denial and never even make our way to anger and for a lot of people who are going through the five stages of grief it's not that you're in denial about what happened you're in denial about how it's impacting you. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you never arrive at the point to where you even acknowledge your own yeah. anger and your own yeah. feelings because you're like, nah, I'm all right. Nah, you know, I'm going to go to therapy. I'm yeah. going to be good. But it, you listen to the therapist like, man, this is going in one ear <laughs> and not the other because I'm really angry. I really want to yeah. scream. I really want to let God know that he let me down. God is God enough to handle what you were feeling. So for the person who's watching or listening and you're like, man, how do I deal with being angry with God? invite him into that yeah. anger invite him into that disappointment yeah. so he can confront it head on he can help you to heal from it to process it and then you'll finally work your way through accepting what he allowed and he will create a clear path for you for you to be able to move past it and here's how i know that to be true um, in the book of ecclesiastes chapter 3 it says that there is a time for everything mm -hmm. under the sun that's ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 Verse four says that there is a time for crying and there is a time for dancing, yeah. which uh, insinuates to me that there should be a, I don't want to say a cutoff point, but there should be a point where I start to move beyond what happened and how it impacted me. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that I will ever outgrow grief, but at a certain time, I do have to start progressively moving yeah. towards a healthier outcome to say, okay, this is the allotted time that God gave me to be in my feelings about this. And even though feelings are God given, at some point I have to move beyond this feeling and move on to something better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bef I right. just, before you answer, just from a pastoral, if as you answer, maybe in answering this as well, um, as you were sharing this, I think the narrative or something that has also just been taught that anger and emotion is a sin. Like mm -hmm. I, I just have heard that I've seen people respond in such a way that yeah. it feels that to have anger or have emotion is actually sinful. Um, so in your response, if you could maybe speak mm -hmm. to kind of like where you feel that originates and how we can do better as just a church and as believers to, to you, I think you explained it beautifully is that those are parts of us that Christ too also experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how can we lay down that disbelief, like that belief that I'm not allowed to have emotions or I'm not allowed to feel these ways um, as you respond? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is the scripture, be angry, mm. but sin not. But sin not. not. Yeah. <laughs> so from the beginning of, of that thought, I think what scripture tells us is that it is expected or anticipated that there will be moments when we are angry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then it says, but sin not, which means anger is not the sin. Right. It is when we lose control of the emotion. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
and the emotions start driving our behavior or our decisions or our choices or our feelings, yeah. even towards God, yeah. mm -hmm. it leads us into sin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a result of, yeah. right, not staying in control mm -hmm. of the emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, one, want to advocate that we start to use, one of the things that therapy has helped me do dramatically is give language to what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. um, if you've never seen like a feelings wheel before, mm -hmm. I highly encourage you get one, you can download it online. Mm -hmm. And a feelings wheel will help you to define, yeah. you know, I'm just this, well, <laughs> what are you really? What are you actually, yeah. Yeah. Like, what are you actually feeling? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, name the emotion. Yeah. But then whatever the emotion is, and in the case of the scripture, be angry, but sin not. Yeah. And so don't let anger lead you to disconnect yeah. from the will of God yeah. for your life, yeah. for your season, for your future. Um, and I think that's sometimes certainly easier said than done. Probably say this every other episode. This is why I believe we need accountability. Yep. Yeah. Because sometimes my anger is leading me to do something and I need somebody who loves me enough to be like, hey, hey, hey. Mm -hmm. that's not really you. Yeah. Yeah. You're hurting. Yeah. What you need is a hug, yeah. mm -hmm. not another drink. Yeah. Mm, yeah. What you need is a hug, not to go call him yeah. or her <laughs> yeah. and stay the night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you need is a hug, yeah. not, <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? And yeah. the list goes on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm not judging any of those things. I'm saying, but very yeah. often yeah. Mm -hmm. what drives us to behaviors yeah. that compromise yeah. our character is I was in my feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so real. <laughs> yeah. And so, real. so, but be angry. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like losing someone you love hurts. Yes. Yeah. Right? Plans not working out hurts. And so I think that is certainly not something to avoid. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually something to trust. And here's the beauty of God. He offers us a transfer. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, scripture says, I want to say it's in Isaiah. Um, it says, you know, uh, he'll give you beauty for ashes, mm -hmm. joy for your sorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, and then he says this, he said, and the garment of praise mm -hmm. for the spirit of heaviness. Yes. Yeah. Which means I always imagine it like his, his hand is always yeah. out mm -hmm. yeah. saying there is an exchange that That's is so available. Good. That's yeah. so good. If you, but, but the first thing you have to do is empty it's, your hands. Yes. Yeah. I think what happens in grief is that we cling. Yes. Yeah. To what I need to hold this. Yes. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, no, what you need to do is give this to me. Yes. Yeah. Giving this to me does not mean you don't feel it. Yeah. It just means I can give you something else mm -hmm. to help with the feelings. Yeah. 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 Um, growing up in hospitals, they would always remind us that medicine doesn't actually take the pain away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It helps you to manage the pain. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I think what we need from Holy Spirit and what we need from God is not to distance ourselves from him, but he said, no, 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 no. I'm the bomb in Gilead. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm the healer. No, no, no. I'm the comforter. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm like, it doesn't always mean that it won't be painful. It means that I help you yeah. Yeah. navigate the pain. Yeah. yeah. And so by rejecting me, and I think this is the ploy of the enemy, mm -hmm. this is why the question was so you know, crucial because it didn't just say you become angry. Yes. It said that you get angry with him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now I make him the cause. Correct. Right. And when I make him the cause, and when I make him the source of the pain, yeah. I now will reject him. Yeah. Yeah. And when I reject him, I gotta run to something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think, no, 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 like I gotta constantly come to him and say, God is faithful, God's mm -hmm. character is the same. Promises are still yes and amen. Yeah. He loves me. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. Yeah. And if his character's the same, I can trust him. Yeah. And um, and so I think we have to be very mindful. And it's funny you mentioned this book. I love, you know, as you know, yeah. I love emotionally healthy spirituality. It's one of the top five books I've ever read. Yeah. And I'm gonna just read this quote from the book at length. Um, and, and I'll close with this for me. Um, it says, ignoring our emotions, is turning our back on reality, mm -hmm. listening to our emotions ushers us into reality and reality is where we meet god yeah. emotions are the language of the soul they are the cry that gives the heart a voice mm. and then it says there's one more the part it says so when we deny our pain losses feelings year after year we become less and less human and we transform slowly into empty shells with smiley faces mm. painted on them mm. and sad to say this is the fruit of much of our discipleship in our churches. Wow. I think the heart of God 
is that you would not be afraid of your humanity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but rather that you would embrace it and know that where you are weak, he is strong. Yeah. And so, um, so I would just encourage you to 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 be angry, but sin not. Yeah. To invite him in. Yeah. And to know that he wants to walk with you. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Man, what an episode. Well, I, I look, we are grateful that you spent this time with us. We, as we prayed in the middle, know that um that many different feelings and emotions may show up in your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't pretend to know every story, um, but we do hope, you know, is that he, uh, meaning God, is willing to step into yeah. all of our stories. Yeah. Um, so uh, we love you, and we can't wait to see you again. And, um, I mean, Omar's already prayed, so I don't know if he got another prayer in him. He, <laughs> he can just say, bless God for the people. Yeah. But, but see, tell them how to stay connected. Yes, yeah, so be sure to continue to follow us uh, on all platforms at Beyond Sunday Pod. We thank you for all the support, all the love um, that you have already shown. But continue to like, comment, subscribe, share, all the things. We truly appreciate it. Amen. God is good. He's faithful. God is good. God <laughs> is good. He's faithful. Bye, y'all. We'll see y'all next time. Deuces.